if I'm not a botanist, I can say this, those trees are different. Now, the botanists can't say that because they're both taxonia and mistletoe. But the, obviously, there's a difference in variety. So I'm doing a study now, and I'm claiming for the Texas Hill Country Ball Cypress that it's a different version of cypress. It's the same species, but it's a genetically slightly different variant of the ball cypress. We're going to call it Taxodium distichum taxana, if, they, we, if we can get away with that. Uh, botanists are very strict. And so there's the uh, characteristics of the typical classic ball cypress, the pyramid shape. You've got four of them right here. Pyramid shape, they've got knees. If these have knees, they're going to have to push up to the brick to get the knees out of the ground. Rapid growth, widely dispersed all across the southeastern United States, all the way up to Illinois. And then you've got the, uh, <clears throat> the hill country ball cypress, dome top or flat top, no knees, very slow growing, and only on the Texas hill country are these trees found. And they're different on every river. Now here's proof that they're different. Here's conventional ball cypress on the Guadalupe River at Green in New Braunfels, and here's the hill country type. These trees are older than these trees. So you can see they're two dramatically different trees, and yet they've been there for hundreds of years. All these old-fashioned Texas botanists studied these trees, but nobody saw the difference. So maybe there is something to be said in majoring in government, because you're not tied into preconceived notions. Now here's the uh, rings of the two trees. This is the typical ball cypress like these right here. These are from canopy branches, 70 feet high, and trees that were knocked down by the big flood of 2002 or 2004. The big flood that overflowed the canyon lake. 2002. And this is uh, 70 feet high in the, t in the hill country variant. This is a much older tree. This is a much younger tree. And what's interesting, you see the, the brown, the distribution on the bottom, and where it's here, it's all around? That brown is what? What is that? Anybody know? It's tannin. It's, it's tannin, it's what makes tea have a, it's a bitterness to it. And you notice that it's uniformly disturbed, distributed in this tree branch, but right here it's on the bottom. That's because the hill country tree, the branches are like this, and the tannin is preferentially located opposite the sun. I believe that's to help prevent insect attack, bark beetle attack, because the bark beetles don't like sunlight, so, but they don't like tannin either. Whereas these branches are up like this, and you can see them right over here, so they're being illuminated from around, and therefore, you get uh, tannin all around the, uh, the bark, or all around the, uh, the ring. Now, we can analyze these tree rings to study floods, droughts, and El Ninos, and then, as I just pointed out, sunlight exposure. The drought of the 1950s. Some of you guys were around in the 1950s. We had a really bad drought, but guess what? The one we're having now is worse. This is a worse drought than the drought of the 1950s. But look at the drought did to the cypress tree on the Guadalupe River. We can see that there's a very thin ring in 1955 and 54. So a very low growth of the tree, all that caused by that huge drought. We next need to look at the real thing. And after we get done, if anybody would like to look at this up close, I'll stick around for a while. This is one of those trees that was knocked down by the flood. And you can see, uh, beautiful wood, by the way, and you can see these, the fungal attack. There's only a few types of fungus that attack ball cypress. So this is called peck. And for some reason, it's popular to use that in furniture in kitchens. That's what I've read. And, and the people that are familiar with cypress wood. The wood is fairly light, but it's extremely resistant to rot. And, and you can study the rings in here, and it's just fascinating, all the detail you can find, like this right here. Another thing you can see is, what shape is this trunk? Well, it's ovoid. It's shaped to resist the flow of water. The Guadalupe River is flowing in this direction. So it has the same shape as a branch from the tree, which has to be able to withstand the weight of the branch. This has to be able to withstand the pressure of the water. And here's a, a crown branch from this tree or one right next to it, showing El Nino's in blue. These are all El Nino years. The white is a Pinatubo eruption largest volcano eruption in all of our lives who are here today, June the 15th, 1991. And this is El Chichon, 1982, which is the second biggest eruption in all of our lifetimes. And those two volcano eruptions actually had a slight impact on the tannin width in the rings of this tree right here. This will be in a scientific paper. And then here's the, uh, the growth of the tree and the flow of the Guadalupe River. So we see that the blue is the, the river flow at Sattler, gauged at Sattler, and the red is the width of the tree rings. So you can see that there's all noise here at the beginning. When the tree was young, you know, it was like a teenager. It wasn't really too organized, wasn't paying attention to life, and so it did all this. And then as it matured, 
it starts tracking the water very nicely. So every time we had a big flood year, we had a big spurt in the growth of the tree. The tree followed the nature that it was uh, planted in or growing in. And then here's a, another way of looking at it. You can take a core out of one of these trees, and you can actually look at the, uh, the details of the uh, uh, influences on the tree. And these cores, I use this one in Brazil. But you can't cut down trees in Brazil. And uh, there's a, a drill in here, and you uh, the drill mounts in this handle, and it's hollow. You, you can bore a hole in the tree. It's called an increment borer. And you pull this out, and you have a section of the tree. The problem is it's only one section of the tree. It doesn't represent the entire tree. So it's not really a slice of the entire life of the tree. But it doesn't kill the tree, so it's very useful for that. So this is the kind of thing you can get from a, a, a boring through a tree. You just have to be very careful that you have boring some other trees as well, because you might be looking through the wrong half of the tree. And let's see, this is a technical, this is looking at a spectrometer, looking through thin sections of the wood and how the tannin influences uh, the spectral transmission of light. And then here's something anybody can do. How many of you have a cell phone? Raise your hand. Okay, everybody. How many cell phones have a camera? Okay. But you are assigned this automatically because this is all you need. Photograph in the full sky to record cloud cover, smoke, dust, smog, and haze. I've been doing this for 20 years, and I've been doing it regularly as part of my daily observation program since 1998. So here's a clear sky in Sedin on January the 2nd, uh, 9th, and here's a smoky sky uh, a few months later. Look at the difference in the sky. You don't need any instruments to tell you what's going on, but you've got a really polluted, smoky sky. You don't need my science instruments to show you that. Anybody can do that. A high school, a middle school student can do that. And here's a time sequence of, uh, this is an animated GIF. It's just showing a sequence of all different, these are daily at solar noon, where I live in Seguin, showing the different sky conditions. You can see some days are really clear. It's really too fast to show you. And others are really cloudy. These data are invaluable, especially when you compare them with the actual raw data that I measure using my instruments. Anybody can do that. It just takes a little bit of time. Here's another thing you can do. You can photograph the glow around the sun. Now, this is a smokestack at, at Texas Lutheran University, and the sun is behind that stack. You see this white glow around the sun? That's called the solar aureole. It tells you a lot about the haze of the sky. And so here's the, you can build one of these. I have a column in Make Magazine, and uh, you can make one of these with hardware store things for about 2 or $3. Dollars. And this attaches to my camera, and I point it at the sun, and this blocks the solar disk, which is it's five degrees, almost one and a half degree in the sky. So you can uh, easily do that, or you can stand behind a flagpole or something and, and get a picture like these. So here we have a day with African dust. Every summer we get lots of dust from the Sahara Desert over Texas, in fact, over all the southeastern United States. And Sarah did a major science project on that. She won first place Texas Junior Academy of Science with her Sahara Dust Project. And here's green as dust, and here's a clear day. Look at the difference. Phenomenal difference in the appearance of the sky. Oh, uh, listen, we live in a society today where you say, what color is the sky? And they look at you like, what do you, what do you mean what color is the sky? Nobody looks at the sky. In the olden days, everybody looked at the sky. All the farmers did. Read about Roman history. Everybody talked about the sky. Is That was going to tell them what the weather was going to be like. Get that back in your life, get that back in your family. Looking at the, every morning, first thing you do when you go outside, you don't pick up the paper, you look at the sky. What color is it? Is the sun got a big glow around it? 